Uh, Tom is a professor at the University of Texas, and uh, in addition to being an expert in MRI, he's also a computational biologist. And I think that's very interesting. He does, uh, if I'm correctly informed, his um, uh, group also does forecast models of cancer. But today he's going to uh, talk about the current challenges in translational MRI. Um, so just the MRI side of, of his work, I see, I think. Um, so let's welcome Tom um, and the stage is yours. Okay, thanks so much. Can everybody see and hear me? Yes, or at least we can yeah, see. All right, Cornelius, thanks for all your patience and getting me up and running here. Um, um, that was a uh, Herculean effort, so thank you very much. And I hope this is of interest. This is a completely different topic than what we've heard about previously. And I think the previous presentations are going to be a lot more interesting than what I have to share with you, because this is sort of very practical um, stuff that keeps some of us awake at night, but it's um, uh, it may or may not be very interesting, but I'll try to make it interesting. All right, so I don't have anything to... Um, uh, to mention here other than apparently I'm an idiot because I couldn't get Zoom to work, but I actually kind of knew that before this. So, so here we go. So here's how I see the next 18 or 20 minutes of your life going. I'm trying to motivate the, um, uh, the problem for trying to translate quantitative MR techniques from the clinical setting to the clinical, from the preclinical setting to the clinical setting through this notion of co-clinical trials, which, uh, you know, has become more and more popular in the last however five or seven years. So I'll try to motivate the problem from there and then dive into details on three things that sort of can hopefully enable us from moving quantitative MR or really quantitative any kind of imaging technique from the from the bench to the bedside. So we'll talk about repeatability and reproducibility of some quant sorry, con common quantitative MRI techniques um, and then uh, issues on the image acquisition side and then how we can go about validating them. So I hopefully after you know, just one slide. I hope you're not too bored yet. But um, um here we go. So there's there's um, um there's been of course enormous advances in our biological understanding of cancer, but some might say it's been painfully slow translating it into clinical care. And so one reason for this is it's really difficult to systematically determine which treatments will work in which cancers. And so experiments that you can't do in a person. Um, uh, in the clinical setting, you can potentially do in animals. And so this notion of a co-clinical trial was designed to try to um, accelerate the gap between what's going on in the lab and what's going on in the clinic. And so basically the idea, a co-clinical trial is one in which an animal-based preclinical study is designed to mimic the clinical study as closely as possible. So here's sort of a, this is an example of a co-clinical trial that our team has going with um, uh, uh, Mike Lewis at Baylor, who's a PDX guy and Daryl Daniel Rubin at Stanford. So this is a human trial in triple negative breast cancer, and so the name of the trial is Cadence. The details aren't terribly important right now, but I'm uh, for the purposes of this this spiel here. So the patient comes in, they're consented, a biopsy is done, and you have the uh, pretreatment MRI. Um, you do some pretreatment omic analysis. So we're doing both radio uh, uh, genomic and imaging stuff. And so these biopsies then that you get from the patient then go to establish PDXs. Um, uh, which will be the box down here in a moment. So, and then you also get a biopsy one week after the first cycle of treatment. The patient goes on docetaxel and carboplatin. MRI happens at three weeks after the first cycle, et cetera. But these biopsies here furnish your, your PDX models, your, your patient-derived xenograft models. So everything that you do to the person, you're gonna do in these same, um, in these same uh, patients. So for example, for one patient, you might get, um, uh, you might have, or in this trial design from one patient, you'll get 13 PDX patients, quote unquote patients. Um, so nine of them are gonna get a vehicle control, four of them will go on the treatment arm, and you might have 30 patients, each one of which is contributing 13. So 30 PDX lines, one from each patient, and then each patient produces 13 of these PDXs that you then do the MRI and the vehicle and the docetaxel in the, the carboplatin to mimic what's happening here and the patient. So at the end of the day, what you want is you want similar imaging techniques for both um, the animal study. So this is a axial cross section of a mouse with a, with a um, um, I believe this is a, a 41 uh, mammary carcinoma on the hind limb here. I don't think this is a PDX model. Um, uh, and so you have your K-trans map, your perfusion permeability map from dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, and you have your apparent diffusion coefficient measurement from diffusion weighted. That's in the preclinical study, that's pretreatment. And then you go here and you go on end cycles of the drug, and then you have the post-treatment, and then you want the very same thing in the patients. And of course, these things that you that, that you're doing in the preclinical setting, the 
dynamic contrast enhanced the diffusion weighting. You can do that, of course, in the clinical setting as well. This is a sagittal cross section. Nipple would be here, chest walls over here, and this is a rather large eight centimeter tumor right here. But the idea is that you can now make these measurements at very high quality in both the preclinical and clinical setting, and you can make measurements up here way more frequently than you can down here where you're sort of data starved. Um, and of course, you have replicates here. You have those 13 animal patients, those, those 13 uh, mouse patients for every one patient you have, at least in the way that our study was designed. But to get to that point where you have that data, you have to do a bunch of hard work that is typically not very sexy. Our lab over the year has written, I don't know, 10 or 12 of these repeatability, reproducibility studies across different MRI and PET scans and uh, PET, uh, PET measurements. And it's always kind of comical because they take so long and they cost so much money. And then they're read by literally tens of people, but it's important work, I think. All right, so we, to be able to get to that high quality data, um, that you're gonna use for your co-clinical trial, you need to worry about at least three things. The repeatability and reproducibility, right? Because you wanna be able to make sure that the measurements that you're making are due to changes in biology and not changes in measurement error. Um, uh, image acquisitions that could address preclinical um, uh, imaging issues. Of course, animals are breathing and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, the, 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 the motion in the, in the chest and the heart cardiac and respiratory motion is a huge problem, of course, for lots of quantitative imaging techniques. And then how are you gonna validate the imaging measurements, right? Imaging is fantastic, right? It's non-invasive, 3D, et cetera. It could be quantitative, but since it's non-invasive, are you really measuring what you think you're measuring? And so that's, these, these things are very difficult to worry about, are very difficult to at attack. So actually Tom Chenevert at, the, um, uh, at Michigan, University of Michigan in, in, in the States has, um, uh, has really been a leader in trying to determine methods to uh, rigorously determine repeatability and reproducibility. So he developed this water ice phantom. And it's just this, you know, this, this tube here where you have water here in this ice uh, A and then surrounded by ice water and you get it down to about zero degrees C. And so you can um, uh, then measure what the diffusion values are and you can send it around to a bunch of different sites, in this case, seven different sites. And the idea is what is the error in the measurement here? And what they found, um, uh, this is about five or six years old now, that the ADC measurements were equivalent across all seven sites around the country with a reproducible value, value of 6.3%. So that's in this well-controlled phantom and that's really good. And that's kind of the best you can kind of hope for because it's you know, not a living system. Um, uh, uh, and about the same time, we did the study for a cohort of mice and we found out that the 95% con uh, confidence interval for the ADC measurement had about a 12% um, a change that you'd have to be able to see to be able to say that change was due to biology, uh, not just error in the measurement. So these were studies where you put the mice in, you do the diffusion measurements, um, you take them out, you wait about two hours, you put them back in and you do some registration to get to approximately the same section of tissue, make the same measurement, and the error is about 12%. Um, uh, in one scanner at one place. You do the same thing in people, right? So here's a similar thing. It's a, much, it's a bucket here, it's much bigger, but water is about, um, uh, you get down, get down to about um, uh, zero degrees C if you bathe it in this uh, uh, ice water. This is what the MR scanner looks like. I always think these are really cool the way ice cubes show up on an MR scan. Um, and so what they did here was they sent this to um, uh, about 20 different, yeah, 20 different MR scanners across seven institutions. And you can see and there's all the major um, uh, vendors, GE, Phillips, and Siemens were represented here. And uh, two field strengths, three Tesla and one and a half Tesla. And you can see that um, uh, th this is like a bland Altman plot, uh, a pseudo bland Altman plot right here. And you can see that um, uh, for two of the three vendors, you're, um, you have very good, um, uh, uh, very narrow confidence intervals, but one was very stable amongst itself, but um, uh, different from the other two. So this raises all sorts of questions about how you're gonna do a clinical trial across multiple sites where all the scanners are probably represented. So this gives really important information on how you're gonna control for that, how you're gonna um, uh, weight the measurements at the different um, uh, sites to uh, determine the best way to, um, uh, to, to, group the, um, um, to group the values. So across all things, the variation of the measured ADC values between all the systems was about plus or minus 10%. And so really that's the take home message is that across all of these measurements, across all the different studies, it did sort of like a pseudo review of this about three years ago. And the rule of thumb is 10 to 15% error um, uh, uh, for these test three test studies across the major um, uh, imaging modalities. So diffusion MRI, contrast enhanced MRI, um, uh, PET MRI, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 FDG PET, it's, uh, it's on the order of about 10%. 
And so they, you do this in, in people as well. And so here is, uh, this is a cranial caudal view of looking at a, a woman with an invasive ductal carcinoma. So there's the diffusion map and there's the, uh, uh, and there's the diffusion um, uh, images themselves. And you can look and you see this was a really early study showing that there were indeed significant differences between benign and malignant lesions, um, uh, even when accounting for uh, different readers and, and different readers making different measurements. So they had 40 patients, um, 80 exams in the diagnostic setting that varied the reader and the measurements, and the, the uh, coefficient of variation was about 8%. Uh, the preclinical DCE MRI repeatability and reproducibility this is really kind of really hard to do. So this is this was in 12 mice. They scan twice within five hours. So it's about 10 half-lives of Magnavis. So you put you get this animal set up, you run your DCE study, you come, you let, bring them back out, they're allowed to wake up and run around, and you wait 10 half-lives and then you repeat the study. Um, um, and uh, and what we found here was that we got confidence intervals on the on these orders here. And when you do the relevant statistics, it translates into the following criteria to see a statistically significant change about 15% for that parameter K transit that people really care about that estimates perfusion and permeability. So these kinds of studies can really help you power your, stu your, 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 your study to determine how many animals you need in a group. They can help you um, uh, determine if you're pooling um, animals from different sites, how many you need to um, account for to make sure that you are accounting for the between scanner variation as well as the within uh, scanner variation. This is a, the last bit on repeatability and reproducibility because I'm kind of actually proud of this one. We're trying to move all this stuff out of the research setting into the community setting, right? Because it's, it's one thing if you can make these measurements and there's, with there's you know, half a dozen PhDs floating over the scanner at an academic research-oriented hospital, but it's quite another thing to do it at the, um, uh, you know, the, the private for-profit um, uh, 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 standard of care practice on the street corner. Um, uh, and so this is a study we did here in, in Austin, where we had um, uh, we partnered with community providers, one in central Austin and one north of Austin and one south of Austin, and we tried to implement quantitative DCE MRI and quantitative diffusion MRI, and, and we took um, uh, uh, healthy subjects uh, around all of these scanners, and we did the phantom studies that we talked about earlier at the different sites, and um, uh, we got a reproducibility of, of a T1 map in the ADC of about eight, eight and a half and about seven percent for these two measurements. And we were really quite thrilled with that with the repeatability value of about 7% and 5% for these um, uh, measurements in the community setting. So when we did this, we got really excited because we thought, okay, now we can, at least in cancer, about 85% of patients get their care at community providers. They don't go to um, uh, you know, the Hopkins and the MD Andersons and the Washington universities of the world. They, they go to the community providers. So if you can do these measurements you know, on Main Street, then you can really potentially impact a, a, a bigger um, a population of, of patients. So with this, we decided that quantitative MRI of the breast is both repeatable and reproducible across MRI scanners and community imaging centers. And just actually, we had a nice result to show that the predictive value of, dis, of, of contrast enhanced MRI and diffusion measurements after um, a, one cycle of uh, neoadjuvant therapy in breast cancer had the same area under the curve as in the ac academic research oriented uh, setting. So we were pretty excited that these repeatability values were able to hold up in a community high throughput kind of setting um, uh, and it translated into, into high predictive value. So then um, uh, what can we do on the image acquisition side to be able to translate in this case from the clinical setting to the preclinical setting where these mice are moving so much. So of course they have to be restrained during the image exam and you have to have dedicated holders. And the big thing of course is anesthesia. And it's actually kind of difficult to determine how much effect anesthesia has on the measurement you're trying to, to, to make. And so the Baylor University team read by this really clever MR physicist, Robia Putler, I don't know if you, if you have encountered her work, but she developed this restraint system that allows for imaging of, of awake mice. And so here's sort of the CAD drawing of it. And there's the realization of it. Snout goes right in here. There's the respiratory pillow that if you've ever done any um, uh, mouse MR you, uh, work, you have nightmares about these things functioning, or at least maybe I do. And so the, the mouse gets sort of gets locked in place there. Um, and just here's the picture just to keep it in your mind, but here's the image. So here's a standard holder of the awake mouse or the brain right here. And then in her holder right here, this is the, um, uh, the awake mouse. And if you were to show this to any, to, at least to me, I would think this mouse was, um, uh, you know, had about 2% isofluorine flowing into its lungs. Um, uh, but this is an awake mouse. And so this was a, this is a, I think this is a really clever leap forward in being able to uh, do, uh, do, uh, do image acquisition that is similar to the, in the clinical 
setting to what you would do in a preclinical setting to try to make those co-clinical trials um, uh, more similar. Of course, regardless of your imaging of a modality, there's this horrible um, um, this, this horrible triumvirate here, this, uh, this balance between spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and signal to noise, um, uh, right? And the joke, of course, is that you can, you can pick two of those and the other one's gonna suffer. So there's been a ton of effort to try to acquire and reconstruct things at bigger than the Nyquist limit. Uh, and you do this by reducing the amount of case space that must be sampled to faithfully reconstruct the image. And so of course, if you just willy nilly and just throw out every other line, you get this well-known alias, aliasing artifact. Um, uh, and so that's not gonna work. So uh, many uh, years ago, sparse MRI became a thing, application of uh, compressed sensing for uh, rapid MR imaging. Um, Mickey Lustig also at Berkeley. Berkeley is being well represented at this session today. I'm a, uh, 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 Dr. Lustig was a, I'm a leader in this area. Um, and so of course, uh, here's the transform of the, uh, of the image. If you randomly throw out 66% of the data, this is a standard reconstruction but if you use a compressed sensing reconstruction, then you can faithfully reconstruct this image using two thirds of the data. And of course, if you're not collecting two thirds of case space, you're saving two thirds the amount of time and you can spend that on, um, uh, on either spatial resolution or, um, uh, or, or SNR. So you can use this technique to do um, uh, any kinds of other measurements here. So this is looking at a, a very fast um, uh, uh, contrast enhanced MRI where you can actually characterize uh, the, the peak of the arterial un input function, which is the, the time rate of change of the concentration of contrast agent in the blood plasma. You have to have this to do the, con the, the, the quantitative uh, contrast enhanced MRI. And it is notoriously difficult to get, but um, uh, with this sort of uh, uh, acquisition and reconstruction, you can get the peak of it. You can um, uh, reduce uh, the amount of time it takes to do DTI of, of brain tumors in the, in the animal by a factor of eight um, uh, and then uh, you can even uh, do this uh, for hyperpolarized metabolic imaging of the heart. So this notion of using um, uh, compressed sensing to accelerate measurements to get past issues of cardiac or respiratory motion in uh, the animal so that you can mimic what's happening in the human is, uh, is kind of exciting because it makes the, the, the co-clinical trial that much more realist. So um, uh, maybe not 10 minutes, because I, 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 think, I think we're supposed to stop like in a minute. It, so. I'll just go rapidly through this. Um, so uh, you can do validations at the region of interest level. So people have tried to do this and for ADC and the VE, which are supposed to both be indirect measurements of cell density. So this was a study with 35 animals, an H and E stain, an ADC map, and your VE map from contrast enhanced MRI. So here we take the histologies, you segment them out and you count the number of cells that are present and you make this map of ADC versus um, extracellular space. And so this, has, uh, this should have about 35 points on here. This is region of interest average. So you can see there's this nice correlation as the amount of extracellular space increases through this gold standard of histology, you get an increase in the ADC value and that's nice. However, for VE, there's this negative correlation which kind of doesn't make sense, which means that our sort of our standard textbook description of what VE is is probably not correct. There's a lot more to say about that, but there's not time right now. So um, uh, ADC is linearly correlated with extracellular space. So at least in cancer, these types of studies, and there's lots of them, these types of studies are telling you that the, you know, the, the, the usual interpretation of, of ADC being correlated with cell density, at least to first order, is probably pretty, pretty correct. And then if you want to do it at the voxel level, you have to work a lot harder. I just think this is, this is just an engineering tour de force, this paper right here. Um, uh, so they have the map of quantitative MRI and the map of quantitative histology here. And so you have to section these, these slices and you have to do it in uh, volumetrically. So if you've ever said at one of those slicers that you use the sliced tissue and you get these five micron sections, you have to have to somehow build those five micron sections back up to a volume on the order of millimeters to match your in vivo MR stuff. And so here's the, the, the registration that happens. And at the end of the day, you have your suite of MR measurements um, uh, spatially co-localized to, in this case, a, a particular stain for a particular tumor antigen that this group was interested in. But this is how you can really um, uh, do the voxel level analysis to, to determine if the measurement that you've shown is repeatable is actually measuring the thing that you think it is. All right, so we're, on, we're at the very end here. So recall that we need to address the repeatability and reproducibility, some techniques to um, enhance the acquisition in the preclinical section setting to, to, to better mirror what's happening in the clinical setting. And then we have to validate the things. These are three things that have to happen 
for us to have co-clinical imaging studies really you know worth their worth, worth their time and effort we didn't discuss anything about what you do with this um, uh, with these um, uh, data after you go through all the hard work of, of getting it going and and this is um, uh, 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 as was mentioned at the beginning this is this is uh, certainly one of my passions here and how, how you use these data to drive predictive models um, a mechanism based mathematical models of who's going to respond and who's not going to respond but if anybody wants to talk about it i would love to talk about that but um, uh, uh, because just this past um I guess it was last month we had our full protocol um, um, published in Nature Protocol that talks takes from image acquisition to the contrast enhanced and diffusion stuff and the segmentation um, uh, to mapping it to a, um, a to a mathematical model then using that to make a prediction to compare patient outcomes to what the model actually predicted in this case for pr predicting who's going to have a complete response for locally advanced um, uh, breast cancer. Um, but for any of this to work, all of this had to be done. All right, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, it looks like we're three minutes over. I apologize for that. And um, uh, and uh, that's that's what I got. Thanks a lot, Tom, for the great talk. Um, we will soon have to move on. Maybe there's time for some quick questions. Um, if the chat doesn't have anything, I would have one. Um, Joe, and we discussed before already with Joe that the biolog biological variation has a big effect on the reproducible readability of these quantitative measurements. I was wondering, for example, with the ADC, I assume it is very much influenced by how um, how much uh, the uh, volunteers uh, drunken before the scans um, and so on. Do you think you could reduce the variation a lot by standardizing, let's say, the time of the day people the are prep. measured? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a big issue for, um, uh, well, for women as they go through their, their, their monthly cycle. There's people yep. have shown that diffusion measurements of the breast, you know, can vary um, uh, depending on where a woman is in their cycle. So that's definitely a concern. But you're thinking in, along the lines of, you know, uh, getting a sheet like you would before you go for a PET scan or your colonoscopy of how to behave for the, the, the 16 Next. to 24 hours before, yeah. before your MR scan. Yeah. That's a good point because all the repeatability studies are done on a time scale much shorter than that. So, uh, yeah, that that um, uh, that's an excellent point. I don't think those studies have been done. It would be, um, uh, it would be difficult. I bet to get funding to do that kind of study. Yeah. But that's I think the, the question is if we how much um, working on the hardware side and protocol side can actually give us if the biology uh, biology is so dominant. Uh, still, it's uh, we you saw, you showed the difference between vendors. That's a systematic error we should get rid of. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. So there's all kinds of error, right? There's the, there's the, one of them is the hardware error. And then there's some, um, uh, uh, there's the variation in true biology that you're talking about. Um, I don't know. I think all you can probably, I don't know. This is a deep question. I know we have to move on. I'm getting nervous. I, 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 I think all you can really do is test your, your, your test retestability yeah. in, a, in a time frame that's, that's narrow. That's having the, having the limits yeah. of what we can actually see the effect sizes we need is uh, the first right. step. Yeah. Yeah. We know in some sense that these things do work because they do show a predictive value. It's just how sensitive are there and when do those measurements have to be made? I think those are the key questions that would be influenced by, by the answer to your question. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity.